little awake? A little bit? Yeah? Yeah? Come on! Yeah! Yeah! Come on! All right. I'm glad that was a light lunch, right? Because otherwise, you know, everybody would have been asleep, including myself. So, welcome everyone. My name is Patrick Kitsior. I've only met one or two of you. I want to bring up, you know, just follow up on what Marcel said. You've got a network. This is an incredible opportunity to not only connect with, you know, uh, entrepreneurs and angel investors, but other entrepreneurs in other countries. I mean, I myself as an entrepreneur live by my network. Whenever I have a problem, regardless of what that problem might be, I know that somewhere in the world there's somebody that has already solved it somehow. And then I, what I'm doing, although I may try to think and sometimes think, oh my God, you know, this has never been done before, I assure you, there's nothing that we do as entrepreneurs that is truly, truly different than what's gone on you know, centuries before. We're solving problems, we're looking for money, we're looking for customers, we're trying to figure things out because what we're generally doing is we're doing things that have probably never been done before. A new business, maybe Facebook or Twitter. Uh, we're not talking about maybe a new hairdresser or a new restaurant. Although being successful in those has their own challenges is how do you differentiate yourself from the person next to you. I'm very easy to find. Um, my personal website is boilingice.com. Right? I turn the impossible and I make it into something that's really easy. That's my personal site. You'll find all my contact information, the businesses that I'm involved in. Uh, I spend most of my time as an entrepreneur working on um, two related startups in the online and mobile learning um, space. And when I'm not doing that, I like to really share my own experience in uh, entrepreneurship and the road that I've traveled. Mm -hmm. um, as I mentioned a little bit before, I was born in Paris. I grew up in New York. Um, I have two passports, but I really do consider myself a New Yorker. Um, it's just a direct way of being, no bullshit. They'll always really get the straight story from me. So I think it's very appropriate and we start off with just a little moment of prayer. Because this is what it's all about. Show me the money. Right? That's why you're pitching. Right? Don't forget that. It doesn't matter if you're a nonprofit or for profit. If you're a nonprofit, you still need to pay the bills. If you're a for profit, you still need to pay the bills. Right? So even if it's just making $1 of profit, that's what you have to do to survive. Now, when you're pitching, Many of you are thinking, well, I'm going to be raising money. But pitching is much more than just raising money. Right? Pitching is about convincing customers to do business with you. The best way to raise money, get it from your customers. It's better than investors. Pitching is about convincing team members to join your startup, to be paid below market wages right, for a small piece of equity that may or may not have any value down the, down the road. So when you're pitching, you're doing a lot more than just raising money. Right? You're looking for customers, you're looking for team members. And frankly, you're always pitching. You're always looking for either a new customer or a new team member or a new investor. I know I am. All the time. That's why it's such a wonderful opportunity to be in a room full of you know, entrepreneurs and investors and people that have so much in common because in one afternoon, you can meet 
maybe a customer, maybe some team members or an investor. Mm -hmm. Keep those things in mind because they, I think we, especially nowadays, in the press is so much talk about the successful quote unquote entrepreneurs who raise millions of dollars, but that's not the measure of success. The measure of success is how well you turn your idea into a sustainable business. Because at the end of the day, it's not how much money you raise, it's really how much of the equity you get to keep. And keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. A little bit of background about myself. I started off life as a banker in New York. Uh, I love banking. Just love working on big deals, you know, with lots of zeros at the end. I had some <laughs> huge clients like KKR and T. Boone Pickens. But what I really, truly love to do and always wanted to do was run my own business. And... The road to running my own business, I thought, was the corporate road. That's, this is the time and place that I grew up in. You didn't really think about starting your own business. You went to work for a large company. So I decided, okay, um, uh, my career at Wall Street had uh, come to an end. It had been a big drop in the market. And I said, okay, what am I going to do next? I really wanted to, to, to work in a corporate environment, so I became the chief financial officer the chief operating officer for a number of public and private companies. What I quickly realized is I loved running the business. I didn't like counting the money. I like making the money. I want to hire an accountant to count the money because I'm better at making it. <laughs> but that still wasn't enough. And about 10 years ago, there's this variety of personal experiences that occurred. I just decided I need to make a complete change with my past. And I embarked on this road of entrepreneurship. Now keep in mind, even as a young banker, I opened up a bank in New York, as an, but I was hired to open up a bank, but it was a brand new business. And throughout my career, I'd always been very entrepreneurial. But about 10 years ago, I said, you know, I've got to do something completely different. And I literally jumped out of the plane without a parachute. And I think being an entrepreneur is doing that. And putting on the parachute, pulling the ripcord, having it open, and then landing on your own two feet, but not knowing you're going to be able to land when you jumped out of the plane. So there's, there's a, a lot to pitching, a lot of little technical details. You're not going to learn all the tricks in one day. Right? Orchard's going to take you through a whole process of the, the, the how of pitching, right? so just speaking slowly or enunciating. Pay attention to those things because they're very, very critical. It's not just what you say, but how you say it. This is my pet peeve. People talk way too fast. Uh, please slow down. If I can't hear what you're saying, it doesn't matter how good it is. So a typical pitch deck, typical, because it depends if this is for your customers or maybe your team members or investors, it's going to be about a dozen or so slides. You can add to that. You can subtract to that. It really depends on how much time you have to make your presentation. Even if you are given a longer period of time, what you want to do is you want to keep to the main points and then have a whole series of slides at the end in an appendix where you can talk in really great detail. But you need to get people involved in your presentation to begin with. Very simple thing, put a cover page on your presentation. Here, I'm going to take you through a presentation that was done by Buffer. Are you all familiar with Buffer? Right? No. Uh, Buffer is a company that helps you post things on your Twitter account and Facebook account and other social media accounts without having to log into 10 different accounts. You just log into Buffer, you say post this on my 10 accounts, and it just does that. 
on a scheduled time. Very, very successful company. When I started the presentation I just had, my name, my email, right? so this is their cover. I think it probably could be a little bit improved, but it is what it is. I want to go through this very quickly, and then we're going to really dive into each one of these slides a little bit more. They came out at a time when <coughs> social media was, was not something most people knew about. So they need to describe the problem in a little bit bigger way, which is what the hell is social media and why is it important? Nowadays, you probably skip this slide because most, most people already know how important that is. Here they're getting into their product, how they actually queue things so that you can post online to all your different accounts. If you've got traction, show it. There's nothing better to convince your audience that you are hot, that you are really, really, you know, pushing back the walls and to say, hey, we've got paying users, we have annual revenue, we've got great margins. That says more than all the other slides. It really does. It shows that you've got a real business. And if you're at that point, you're really quite fortunate. Are there anybody that, is there anybody here that is at that point? How many people have revenues? Yeah, okay. Well, that's a good point. Sometimes you have you have traction that's not necessarily revenues. So Twitter in its first week, within a couple of days of launching, had 100,000 users. 100,000 users in, in a week? That's incredible traction. By the end of the second week, might have been the third week, they had a check for a million and a half. Right? No revenues, just based on the traction. It's just like, this is taken off, we know it's going to work. So traction is not always about money coming in, it can also be about users. Or you have three major signed contracts with three major companies. Another way to show traction is the fact that you have a whole variety of milestones that you've met. Sometimes these get a little bit softer when you see a, a milestone. But it just shows, it can show, that you've actually made progress, that you're not just you know, starting with a napkin. Nothing wrong with that. Compact computers get funded based on, off of the napkin. So all things are possible. We spend a lot of time talking about business models. Buffer already had figured out what their business model was. Twitter, they didn't really know, they just knew they were going to get a lot of users. But if that's, that's what's happening in your company, it doesn't really matter. The investors know that if you have a lot of users, eventually you can monetize that. Mm -hmm. right? That's not their focus. They just, they'll tell you, focus on growing the user base. Don't worry about the revenue model. It'll fix itself. Matter of fact, I, you know, in my own experience, that the revenue model is something that kind of moves. So that right now, I'm testing out different pricing uh, scenarios for one of my businesses. You know, to, is it going to be a thousand dollars? Is it going to be fifteen hundred dollars? Is it going to be eight hundred dollars? I'm testing different things out to see where, what the sweet spot is in the marketplace. Talking a little bit more about the market size. We'll, we'll talk more about that as we dig, dig down into the, the various slides. And here they're telling you why it's such great. Um, a little bit more about the product, their competitive landscape. I'm not quite sure this slide really convinces me, but it certainly looks pretty. Right? Um, they're right in kind of the, the hubbub of everything. I think they could have done a better job on that. Right? I really like this team slide. Very, very, you know, the only thing that really matters is they talk about Joel. He took an idea to revenues in seven weeks. He's got a master's degree in computer science. 
And Leo, he took buffer from 200 to 55,000 users. Do I really need to know anything else about those, those people? You know, they're rock stars. They've done it. Right? It's instant sell. Instant validation on the team. Does it have to be like one of the team members had, um, has a like, um, you know, experience or achievement in, in something else other than company? You mentioned that. You, you, absolutely. This happens to be within Buffer, so it's it's even that much more powerful. But you know, if uh, you're developing, you know, you're doing a, a, a med tech app, and you happen to have a, you know, Nobel Prize in. In, in chemistry, that might be a little bit of yeah, an important thing to mention. It's going to be hard like, to find something achieved in this specific company or in this specific startup. So you have to be tell the truth. Just yeah. tell the truth. Don't make things up. Don't bullshit. Yeah. You know, bullshit starts smelling right away. It just does. Okay. Just be very, very honest about your experience. And it might be as brutally honest as we don't have a clue what we're doing, but boy, are we motivated. We've been working on this for the last six months, 60 hours a week. We haven't seen, you know, any of our family members, and we just launched last week. We already have 100, you know, users. Tell a story. Right? Get people emotionally involved in what you're doing. Right? Matter of fact, that's that's a that's an interesting point. Emotionally involved. There's a there's a very successful angel investor that I've gotten to know out in California. And we only talk a little bit. Okay? And I'll tell you the reason why. Because he said to me, Patrick, if you continue talking to me about what you're doing, I'm going to fall in love with it. And I can't afford to fall in love with something. I thought it was a, a very revealing comment. And I completely respect his opinion because I know I would have made him fall in love with it. Yeah. It was like, wow, that's and it's nice. It's too bad. I really like him. I wish I could just hang out with him. You know, so every once in a while I'll ask him a question or something. Uh, he's very generous in giving his responses. Another point about networking right? it doesn't mean you, you stay in touch with the person all the time. But, you know, you just kind of touch base with them maybe once a year. Every year and a half or two years, it doesn't, you know, but it's got to be genuine, not, not fake. And here, this is our ending uh, slide. Here's how you contact us. Mm -hmm. A little bit better than I think the first one. <laughs> so cover, have a cover at the beginning and at the end. I, I kind of like to repeat it uh, because when you're standing in front of the audience, you're generally you're being introduced, or maybe there's a problem with the audiovisual equipment. It takes time for people to get it together, the room quiet down. At least you have something that keeps gives the audience something to look at. And at the end, during the Q&A period, hey, people have your name, email, address, maybe even your telephone number so that they can contact you. So it's silly, it's, but it's important. The problem, now this is one that I see a lot of people get wrong, and it's one that you can get wrong not only from a presentation standpoint, but you get it wrong because you don't know what the problem is. So there's, there's something called the five whys. We can talk about it you know, from an academic point of view, but there's a little exercise that says, so for example, you get into your car, right? You turn on the ignition, nothing happens. So well, the battery's dead. Why? Why? Uh, there's some problem with the alternator. That's the thing that makes the battery stay charged, right? So why? Ah, uh, maybe the, the belt on the alternator is broken. Why? Oh, right? Because I didn't do the proper maintenance that I needed to do. Why? Because I didn't read the manual. Why? Because I feel you know, I don't like reading manuals. Nobody does. Right? So as you go through that process, you know, and you identify where the problem is, you might be able, you might identify that it's a problem that may not be solvable. How do you get people to read a manual? 
Okay. Sure, good, good. <coughs> Word, have, have, have a chip in the motor that, can, that sends an email to, to the owner and the garage saying, hey, this person hasn't read the manual, but you know, it's okay because we know what the problem is, so send the tow truck to fix it. So you're not always aware of what the problem is, which goes back to the point that was being made before, which is get out the door and go talk to your customers. You're not going to figure it out by staying in the office coding. You've got to get out the door. You've got to meet customers. You've got to ask them why. Why do you want to buy this? You'll be shocked by what customers actually have to say. Your solution is your solution, but again, it's got to be from experience of what you've learned from being outside the door. Is it something that people really, really want to buy? Because this is where you're building your pitch. Yes, we know there's a problem. We have this great app that solves the problem. This is how we're going to make money at it. This is how much we're going to charge you to buy the solution. And the product is talks more about you know what you actually do. Maybe it's a screenshot of your your actual application or your software, or maybe the uh, the new engine that you've uh, invented. You actually show what it is that you have, and it doesn't even have to be real. It could just be a graphic mock-up. I mean, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, it's a great process of trying to get selling something to sell something that doesn't exist. And if you get people to actually buy it, then go back and build it so that you can deliver it within the 60 days that you told them you deliver it. Market size, well, um, don't believe the online statistics that you're going to find. I just don't. I certainly don't. Um, British Prime Minister says, once said that there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Okay, that's how I feel about market surveys and market size. Where this really starts mattering is, do you understand your market? I'm going to sell to the 400 million individuals that live in Europe. Roughly, right? Well, how many, but who do you really sell to? Well, we only sell to women, so that's 200 million. And we only sell to women between the ages of you know, 20 and 30. Right? So, but describe that process right, of what your addressable market is so that you can demonstrate to the person that's listening to you, that you really do understand who you're selling to. Because that's what this is, slide is describing. Do you understand who you're selling to? And how big is that market? Now, people who really want the only right answer for, for, for a certain type of investor, venture capitalist, is, is a billion-dollar opportunity. VCs of a certain level, they're really not interested in investing in something that's going to become a $20 million company. The only thing they're looking for is something with unicorn potential. Are you going to be a billion dollar, dollar company in a short period of time? And the only way to do that is to have something that a lot of people want. So you look at an Uber, you say Uber has a valuation that's over $60 billion because you can take that Uber model, their app, and you can put it into every major city in the world. Mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> That's truly big market size. We talked a little bit about traction. Uh, if you focus on building your business, this will take care of itself. 
this will take care of itself, the revenue model will take care of itself, the business will take care of itself. You can't be expected to have all the answers and all the slides filled in. You just can't. So don't try to fake it, right? Because it's noticeable. And if you're faking it, then certainly I don't want to invest in you because you're not telling the truth. That's very, that's really, really important. You've got to stay ethical. You've got to be honest. You've got to be honest to your investors, yes. But you know who's who's even more difficult to be honest with? Yourself. Yourself. It is so easy to deceive yourself. Say, oh, yeah, you know, I've, uh, this is going to work. Yeah, I just, it's hard. It's just, you know, it's, it's hard. I'm always asking my question, you know, myself the same question. Say, Am I doing the right thing? It's good to question yourself. Bear, oh, sorry for the typo. Uh, barriers to entry. Yes, actually, that's a that's a very good. Uh, <laughs> when you when you do a presentation, do a spell check and make sure your language is set to the language of your uh, of your presentation. Uh, so maybe you don't have barriers to entry. Right? Maybe. The barrier to entry is we need to roll this out as quickly as possible. I mean, truly, an Uber, what's the barrier to entry? It's not a really difficult app to build. Anybody can build it. Just a location app with a, with a GPS system and a shopping cart. That, that, technically, it's not that big of a deal. What's the real barrier to entry? Being in every single major city in the world in the space of Two years, mm -hmm. three years. I mean, they roll that thing out like boom, right? That's why they raised so much money because it was a speed to just be in every single major city in the world. Right? That's a barrier to entry. The problem is if there, there are no barriers to entry, it's going to be easier for others to just enter your market. Is there a way you can make it hard for them? Really? Yeah, how, how how difficult? I mean, really, how many how many cab companies are there? There's Uber, there's Lyft, in some cities, mm -hmm. and some local startup that that has some kind of success. So you have one, two, maybe three companies that do that. With Uber having a good seventy percent plus market share, I would assume. In, in those markets, would be the first to market with a good uh, brand. Uh, be very careful about first to market. Uh, that's a that's a poisonous set of words. Uh, it was used very uh, um, successfully in, in the early twos by a lot of companies to raise money. We're first to market, and we're first to die. <laughs> right? It's like, we don't know what we're doing. We're showing everybody what not to do. And the next person came in, said, okay, great. We're the second to market. We're not going to make the mistakes the other people did. We're going to be successful. Right? So was Google the first search engine? No. No. Not even by, you know, it must have been at least seven or eight, at least. Search engines were getting funded like left and right. Mm -hmm. I happened to meet uh, somebody in Paris not too long ago, and we were talking about doing some things together, and they said to me, they told me this great story of how they had been interviewed at Google, and they were going to be head of business development worldwide, and employee number seven, I believe, might have been six. And they said, ah, no, you guys will never go anywhere. You know, I use OptiVista. <laughs> Nobody remembers OptiVista. <laughs> what made the difference with Google right, is that Google's got some major VC funding right, who understood that what you needed to do was you needed to do that kind of Uber thing, make sure that Google was everywhere, that dominant, dominant market share. Right? And the way you do that is, boy, if you can pour, you know, couple hundred million or a billion dollars into a startup 
They're going to own the world. They're going to own the world. And then what are you going to have? You're going to have a monopoly. When you have monopoly, you have monopoly pricing. And you have monopoly profits. Mm -hmm. That's how the world works. That's why we had a little prayer. Mm -hmm. Please don't tell me you have an exit plan. <laughs> I'm serious. Um, I mean, I got that. I got asked that question not too long ago by an angel investor, and I said to them, "You got to be kidding me! Right? That is a stupid question." I really said that. I just like, I just like, I can't believe you asked me that question. You know what my answer was? I did say that. I said that's a stupid question. <laughs> and they what? I should be focusing on the business. I should be focusing on growing the business, getting revenues, getting customers, and building the team, not thinking about my exit. That's going to take care of itself if I've got a really successful business. And it's true. But they, like, and they nod at their head. They agree. Because sometimes you do like, have to think about that. Because if you're, if you're successful, but don't you put it, it, but then you should be, you, look, we all know the answer. You know, we're going to get bought out by Apple, Google, some major company, you know, or another startup that just got a billion dollars of funding that's looking to buy a couple of startups because they really don't have anything. And their whole strategy is, is buying other startups that do. But don't, don't, don't put it in a slide. But if somebody really truly pushes you, you can have a, an intelligent discussion after you've told them I need to focus on the business, mm -hmm. but I have thought about this, and here are the reasons why I think we can be a good fit for Amazon, Apple, right? And, but give them real, real reasons, not just we're going to get bought out. The reality in today's world is that most startups do not go to IPO. They get bought out by an existing company. Mm -hmm. And they do not get bought out for hundreds of millions of dollars. The average exit ticket is about 20 to 25 million. Which ain't a bad payday if you own you know, 20 or 30%. If you still own that. And hopefully you still do. It's still still small and you haven't really raised that much yet. Competition, absolutely. The answer, I have no competition. Um, I'm showing you the door, I'm saying thank you very much. I, you know, I mean really, what, where, what planet are you from? Every, everybody's got competition. Right? I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, I mean, it just does. It doesn't have to be exactly what, what you do. It be indirect. Absolutely. I, I mean, the, we're talk, I was talking to, to someone in the audience about this just, you know, earlier today. And it's like, well, what's the competition to a laptop, right? Well, the competition, I, I can take notes, you know, on a piece of paper with a pen. And if I don't have that, I can just write things in the sand, right? If I don't have that, maybe I take a, a hammer and a chisel and I carve something into the wall. There's all kinds of different ways that I can achieve taking notes. I don't need a laptop, per se. Or I just develop my memory and I never have to take it. <laughs> so do yourself the favor. Think about who your true, what the true alternatives are to you using your product. Because mm -hmm. maybe you'll, you'll discover that, oh my god, I'm really not that special. And I really don't have a competitive advantage. So why the hell am I doing this? Oh, maybe I should pivot. Maybe I should find something that people truly want to buy. How are we doing on time? Uh, we did 20 minutes. Okay. So team. Team is, this is, this is, this is really, really key. I, I mean, you, you've all heard it. Um, earlier on in the process, it's a very, it's probably a more important factor then later on in the process, as you go up the funding um, chain, market size becomes more important. Why? Because I can replace all of you and hire somebody with 20 years experience at a top company 
and all I have to pay them is, you know, maybe a million bucks a year, you know, maybe a half a point of equity. And I just kick you out. You, we're all expendable as entrepreneurs. I just have to remember that most of the time. Um, I think there's, there's been so many big arguments about it, the exceptions having occurred. But at the beginning, though, there's nothing more critical than the team. Um, and not just the resume of the team. Oh, that's, that's really critical. But how well the team works together. Have they worked together on other projects? That's usually a good barometer of why we're working well together. Yes, we've been coding together since, you know, uh, high school. Uh, we've been together, you know, hanging out as buddies uh, for the last uh, 10 years. And, you know, we just came up with this. What should the balance of the team be? Well, ideally, you know, there's always a technical founder, a non-technical founder. Ideally, you know, um, if you're not a technical person, you can always find a technical person. Mm -hmm. And if you don't really want to give them founder's equity, you know, a big piece of founder's equity, then you'll just have to find a way to convince your investors that it's not as critical as they think. It's not going to be an easy one, but you've got to you got to do what you got to do. I have a friend of mine who goes, "What do I need to hire? Why do I need to know the technical stuff? I just hire technical people. They work for me. I'm the boss. I'm the CEO. I'm the founder. That's his whole way of being, and he's been very successful doing it that way. Yeah. Which is very it's a it's diff, it's actually it's refreshing. It's different. I mean, and he's right in some respects. I mean, it's not like he's asking people to to do very esoteric technical stuff. Um, you can just hire teams. There's lots of teams out there. And have proper documentation for that, for their work. Yeah, good luck with that. Really? Good luck with <laughs> That's that. That's yeah. no, no, no. Getting proper coding documentation? Are you kidding me? My <laughs> <laughs> God. You must believe in fairies and, and unicorns, real unicorns. No, no, I mean, I don't mean just coding. I mean, like, Every part of it, like if you want to replace someone, you just need their work to be documented so that you can, like, easily replace them and have someone. <laughs> Not gonna happen. Stuff. Not gonna happen. No. Yeah, I don't think That's so. Yeah, yeah. It's very hard to get coders to yeah. document their code, and much less to get anybody that's on a the, the, the business side to document what they do. Mm -hmm. It's part of their job security. You, know, you you need to create the team. You need to create the environment. You need to create a real desire for people to work for you and with you because they really believe in what you're doing. Yes, you can. I, I know I, I, this is what I do. I've got a, a you know, diversified global team of about six people. I've got a co-founder in Chile. I have a designer in Tunisia. I have programmers in Ukraine. Um, every once in a while, I'll pay them. Every once in a while, when there's money. But they all contribute on a regular, regular basis, because they believe in what we're building together. Right? You create that environment. It's up to you. You are the leader. And by being a leader, it doesn't mean you have to be always you know, flamboyant or just, just pitch your team on a regular basis. Give them the updates. Tell them what you're doing. You know, don't, don't just share the, 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 the great moments. Share with them. Like, oh my God, I don't know, you know, we just lost a major customer. So I can't hide that one, but, you know, I mean, share things with them because they'll believe you. Financial revenue models. For all you math geniuses out there, it's a very simple, simple model. Okay. So we'll take the first part. Okay. It's called revenues. Right? Say that. Revenues. Revenues. Come on. Revenues. <laughs> revenues. Minus costs. Minus costs. Right? Equals, it's either positive or negative. That's profit. Okay? That's really, that's the math that you need to do your revenue model. Right? Don't get too fancy. Okay, 
mean, you can, and I've seen and, and worked on some very esoteric type models that really get granular. At the end of the day, the person sitting on the other side of the table is going to want to know some very simple things, right? So, how much? What, what's your price? Oh, I sell this for a dollar. How many customers do you have? Oh, okay, you have ten customers. Well, so you made ten dollars. Okay. And your cost? What's your cost? Well, my cost is fifty cents. Right? This is what per customer. And you guy, and you go. No, that's my total cost because I'm in the software business and I have outrageous margins. Right? <laughs> so that's fifty. So you make nine dollars and fifty cents. A profit, right? Okay, that's it. Keep it simple. I'm giving it to you to really simple because if you can't explain it that simply, right, you're gonna get people are gonna get lost. The way you build your revenue model, but still using same math plus and minus, right? This is nothing. Is you simply have across the top a periods of time. Right? So you're all magical wizards. Your crystal ball is almost accurate for the next 12 months. After that, it becomes really cloudy. And then by the time it's in the third year, it's basically black, but you never want to you know, tell that to the world because, yeah, it's like. Or sales that put up your finger, see where the wind's blowing. Right? So you get granular maybe between you know the first and twelve months, and then after that just do it on a quarterly basis. Okay. Now of course, you start at the top, right? It's revenues, but you have no idea what that is for some period of time. Because you don't have anything. And what are your costs? Well, you don't really know what your costs are because you haven't figured it out yet. So what you need to do is identify all the tasks that we need to do. Right? I need to build, I uh, say, task one is a website. Task two is uh, you know, social media planning. Uh, over here, I'm going to do task three. That's going to be a coder. Um, they're going to be around for a while, so I've got to pay them, you know, every month or every quarter. Just go down the list. Think about all the tasks that you need to get done. And think about the personnel you're going to need, the resources you're going to need, and just list those. Once you've listed them, then it's really just a question of adding numbers. Right? The cost for one, the cost for two, the cost for three. And at some point, once you have a product that you can actually sell because you've done some marketing or you've gone and, and tested it, then you're going to start showing revenues, and then it's going to be really easy. It's going to be revenues minus your costs right, equals your profit. It's a simple way to think about building your actual model. Keep it simple. And how much money are you going to raise? Well, you're going to raise money to cover all of your costs until you run out of money. Then you want to add some more money because you never want to raise money when you have no money. <laughs> it's just not good. It's just not good. You're just like, you're dead. You're giving up much more equity than you need to. So the answer to the question, how much one way do you have, is always, oh, six months. And it should always be at least six months. That's your question. Uh, can we move the financials that we move into the appendix? To, you can move all the details to the appendix and just show the summaries on the um, on the slide. Mm -hmm. right. And I'll, I'll show you. And then I've got another example. You just have you know revenues in year three, you know ten million uh, margin of fifty percent, you know expected profits of you know uh, five million. Just, just ballpark it, because you don't want to get into, well, should it be 10 million, should it be 12 million? It's really orders of magnitude. Are you going to be a $10 million company or a $100 million company? 
But at, at the scale that we're working at, it still doesn't add up to the million two million capable uh, in the first two, three years. I don't know. So that's that's normal or it normal. could be a very nice business that makes good money for yourself and may provide a good return for your investors and may never be more than that. But what's wrong with that? No, but when you're doing, for example, for, when you're doing the calculations, I'm doing it for the market that I'm working in, which is my first market. But if I do this for a bigger, you know, a bigger one, for example, the Mena region, it's going to be the third number. If I deal with globally, it's going to be the third number. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm reporting so my market number. So, so, so your, your revenue market, revenue line is in quarter one, we're going to be in the, we're going to make five million in the Mena region. By the third quarter, we're going to expand to um, to Europe, and revenues will be twenty million. Mm -hmm. By the second year of launch, we'll be at a hundred million because we'll be global. So mm -hmm. Tell the story, make sure you've got real backup. Say, so, you know, in order to achieve that, this is our plan. We're going to need to raise money, additional funds to be able to to achieve those. Um, be really careful about. If you put so much about where you think things are going, you're going to be held accountable to that. Mm -hmm. if you, there's nobody. Um, I think John Doerr, the, the very famous venture capitalist um, in California, said in all his years' experience of investing, one company, only one company made its numbers. The purpose of the numbers is to show that you've thought about how this could go. And you, you're thinking about it as a business, not just as a coder, but like, oh, this is how we can develop this into something that's really substantial. I always say, um, Patrick, lower the expectation and deliver high. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's estimation, after all. It is estimation. Look. Unless... You know, you already ha you're already at the point where you truly have sales, and you you've developed a formula yeah. that you know that if I spend, it's going to cost me five million dollars to open up a new city. I'm going to need to hire a city manager, a couple of support people, some social media people. I'll need to you know uh, spend some money on the press. Um, all I need, I have my programmers work for a couple of days to add the GPS location on the city, and we're done. And we know that within the first three months, revenues will be X based on a certain percentage of the population of the city. And you, you already have that from the past. Then it's no longer it's magic. It's, it's, it's truly you're, you're basing the next steps on past performance. Are you sure that we can hold this, all these slides and all this talk in four minutes? They're going to be one slide. That's the that's challenge. Yeah. Yeah, four minutes. Four minutes is four minutes. Is good. That's good. Three minutes is tight. <laughs> Three is tight. Two is really tight. It's it's a lot for four minutes. That's why. Then you're talking. You're saying too much. Yeah. Saying too much. Yes. Well, I've never seen actually you know, an ended. I mean, really, let's say 10 slides. 30 yeah. seconds a slide. It's five minutes. It's a little less than that. Any information they ask for, we can provide it later. But now you can just show the headline. This is how much. This is this. This is this. Anything else, you can send it at the end. We can send it Maybe we should get into details of the financial data because it could take some time. I'm going to show you a presentation done by a very famous company. You'll see how they dealt with that question. And tell them the amount you're raising, if it's in fact a pitch to investors, and how are you going to use those funds? Use it for marketing, you know, uh, further development, mm -hmm. uh, whatever it is that you're going to actually need the funds for, and have the details available, perhaps in an appendix. Mm -hmm. 
And then you're covering the end slide where you open it up to Q&A. Mm -hmm. So, you heard of this company? Yeah. yeah. So this is one of their early decks. I had a, I found most, a lot of the slides, but not all of the slides. Um, so there, there's a few that are missing, but it's rather interesting. They were first called Air Bed and Breakfast, not Airbnb. They, they got a little bit of problem uh, uh, after a while. But. So slide one, they have most of them have numbers. Here's a problem. Right? They talk about it. Too many bullets, uh, too many points, because you want to really have people focus on what you're saying instead of having them read. Mm -hmm. right? but, right, it's, it gets the point across. Here's their solution. Again, not that, not that great a slide. Market validation. They talk about how there's, uh, there's, there is demand. That's what they're showing. Right? Not that there's demand for Airbnb, but that there's demand for temporary housing because on Craigslist, during a you know, long period of time, uh, this is from 09 to um, 2016, there were 17,000 listings. So it clearly shows that people putting their apartments for rent and somebody's renting because it's on Craigslist. Right? So there's some validation that if you didn't know, even know about this market, you're kind of going, Huh, that's interesting. I never thought about that. And here they're talking about what the potential market size is. In other words, it's freaking big. Right? So, ooh, ooh, let me pay attention. Right? And here's their product. They're showing you how they actually do it. This is probably the first slide that gives you a sense of, of what this actually does. Right? Business model. Market share. Average fee, $200 million of revenue. They've taken everything here, and they just give it to you. Mm -hmm. Boom, that's it. This is how we're going to do it. Any questions? Right. That's not enough. I saw an update on this slide. Uh, the, the new number was $2 billion. <laughs> they talk about market adoption. Right. Their competition is okay. They do it in this is a marketing matrix. Um, it's good. It's all right. Their competitive advantages. Oh, well, this is Laura Epson. I don't know where the real. I guess the, they replaced the uh, the actual text. Right. Here they have their team members. And they have a, you know, I'm sure that they did, they really have a very good story. Where they literally tested this out, where they put an ad up online, and they had somebody come in and stay at their apartment, and literally they rented the sofa for the night. You're like, that's proof of concept? Yeah, that's proof of concept. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put up an ad saying, sleep on my couch, pay me money, and somebody shows up at your door, pays you money to sleep on your couch, that's proof of concept. If you can do that for your couch, imagine what you could do for the entire apartment. And considering that, all those Craigslist things, right, there's something there. Financials, very simple. It's showing what the angel round is going to be, um, how many bookings they're expecting, what kind of revenues they expect to get from that. Really lowering the expectation. And then that's it. There's a couple of slides missing, but it's very clean. It's, it's short. It's a simple story. And the best stories are generally very simple. Mm -hmm. Should we add something like uh, how many... For instance, for a startup that start to raise money, can we talk about how many have we raised? And, sure, know, sure. And the, and yes. the can, prize but I hope that's not a success paid. factor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. So, so yes, okay. we've we, we've you know we've we funded ourselves. We've already raised. Okay. Uh, right. For example, um, you know, I I've raised a quarter of a million dollars of equity-free money mm -hmm. from. 
government in innovation grants. And it shows a certain level of, yeah, we've been hustling. We've been doing things. With it. But that shouldn't be like, that's not your ultimate me me no, no. metric. Um, you can go to uh, to this URL if you go to tinyurl.com slash boiling ice pitch deck samples. There's a bunch of samples. Um, now, this is going to get distributed, so you'll you'll be you'll you'll have access to this uh, this slide deck. Um, there's some samples. Go and look how other people have done their pitch decks. You may not know the companies or heard of them, but it's interesting, it's informative. Right? You yourself need to educate yourself about becoming you know, really good at pitching. And the only way to do that is by seeing how other people have pitched. So when you hear and see everyone pitching uh, tomorrow, take notes. Oh, I like that. Oh, I didn't like that. Well, that's a great slide. Oh, I like the way they did that. Right? And keep note of that. And then incorporate those ideas into your own presentation. You're not going to make a great deck the first time. Maybe you won't, but chances are that you won't. <coughs> it's something that continues to evolve. And a great deck isn't necessarily one that has great graphics or that's beautiful. It could just be very simple. A couple of bullet points on a page. Maybe one word on a page. Mm -hmm. If you're going to use the uh, Steve Jobs approach to presentations. Or a picture. I saw a hand raised. When we get into the pitch deck, uh, it's interesting you're presenting and the deck is actually your visual support, uh, where you don't have lots of detail. And then somebody from the audience says, I'm interested, send it to me. And this happened to me. Uh, yes. It was a bit ridiculous because uh, as a lawyer, Excellent you question. Tell the That's right. Deck. So you have, you basically, and it's, let's talk about the mechanics of building the pitch deck. Okay. Now you see, I don't have a lot of bullet points, I don't have a lot of text, because it detracts from the presentation. Mm -hmm. So what I would normally do is, in the notes section of PowerPoint, you put all your notes with bullet points. You can have full paragraphs, competition, describe the competition, list all the competition, you know, include links to other, to other resources. Mm -hmm. You can do it that way. Or you could put the notes right on the slide and not really have a slide, just basically have a whole series. Two versions. The two one versions, one with pictures and, and one with just one a lot of text. One of okay. Or a third type, which is you have the pictures with the notes. Okay. What I'm seeing, and I think it's going to be evolving, about where pitch decks are going, I think the business plan is dead. And we can talk about that. I think it's more alive in Europe. In the U.S., it's practically dead. Nobody, a, a business plan should, is, is out of date by the time you finish it. Yeah. It's actually out of date by the time you get to about the halfway point. Right? Things are moving so fast. I think the direction that we're going is, do you have a one or two pager that summarizes your business? It's, it's, it, it's, it's an executive summary to another level. Mm -hmm. It really captures all those major points. Problem, solution, product, competition, market size, revenue model. You could just have that and just a simple paragraph. People can just read it, yeah, okay, I'm interested, no, I'm not. Because you need to communicate. That is the key to what you're trying to do, is you're trying to communicate your position to either a customer, a team member, or an investor. And you need to decide what's the best way to communicate. Is it just a simple slide deck, slide deck with notes, or just a two-pager? Okay. And I uh, just want to say thank you very much, and I hope to uh, have an opportunity of meeting all of you individually. Thank you. Thank you.